Good afternoon and God bless you guys. My name is David Bisono. I am the uh, Sadlier Religion um, mar managing um, market manager, and I am excited to um, have you guys all connected today for this exciting uh, webinar entitled Eucharist, Food That Satisfies Our Deepest Hunger. I hope you all are excited and ready to receive what Tom has prepared for all of us. Before we start, let me introduce our um, guest today. His name is Tom Quinlan. He is the Director of the Religious Education Office in the Diocese of Joliet, Illinois, not to be confused with Chicago. He is the co-chair of NCCL's Evangelization Committee. Tom holds a Master's of Divinity from the University of St. Mary of the Lake and has presented at national conferences and for the diocese across the country on a variety of faith and ministry topics. He is an avid traveler and photographer of Western North America. His wife, Christy, is a parish catechetical leader. So we hope you enjoy. Tom, thank you so much for accepting. Um, Everyone, just open your hearts, your ears, and um, get ready to receive instruction and inspiration from my brother, Tom Quinlan. David, thank you so much, and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is our first Sadlier webinar of the season, so we're, we're uh, making sure all the technology works right. So uh, I'm delighted to be with you for the first part of two uh, components to what I call a, a mini retreat on the Eucharist and the title is Eucharist food that satisfies our deepest hunger. A funny thing I um, did the first uh, part last year uh, but they were not able to capture the uh, the webinar so we're, we're having a part two or a second run of part one here so You'll be able to go listen to part two right after this if you are so inclined. And I am trying to move my screen. Let's see if I can do that now. And here we go. So in this hour, I'm going to be toggling between um, trying to provide direct experience as if you were parents attending a, a faith formation session. Uh, something perhaps preparing parents for their child's first Eucharist and first reconciliation. I'll be trying to do that and at the same time trying to model for you as catechetical leaders what parent first Eucharist uh, preparation sessions might look like and feel like. So kind of hold those two realities together. If you are not listening live, you'll have the benefit of being able to pause anytime you like to um, take as much time on the reflection questions that we have uh, throughout here. If you're listening live, we've got to keep going because we only have an hour here today. Uh, and I would love for this to be more reflective and slower paced. So keep that in mind. So the two parts uh, of this little mini retreat, part one has a motif that I call journey. So keep that in mind. We're going to be looking at Eucharist from the perspective of journey. And then part two, uh, we shift to a hunger motif uh, in reflecting on the Eucharist. Not too long ago, I was thinking about uh, GPS technology, global positioning um, technology that allows you to know where you are or have somebody else know where you are at any point. And sometimes these devices are put on cars. I, I thought to myself, what if one had been strapped to me at birth, and what would it look like on the map now showing all the places that I have been, the routes that I've taken to get to all the places I've been in my life, and the people I've met and the experiences I've had. Kind of a, a metaphor for being able to reflect back and see the totality of what has been the journey of one's life. Um, I've been pondering that concept, and I invite you to think about what would the map look like for you, both in terms of geography and ex life experiences and the people that you've encountered. It's my conviction that every life is a journey filled with joys and sorrows, hopes fulfilled and unfulfilled, 
um, twists and turns, and every life is filled with meaning. I think this is a profoundly Catholic insight that we are assured to be true because of what God has done in, in salvation history. Your life and my life are filled with meaning. So let's now turn to feed on God's word, listening to that ever so beautiful and ever so rich uh, road to Emmaus gospel reading. Let's quiet ourselves for just a moment. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing along the way? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? What sort of things? The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. We were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what was referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we hear this story every Easter season and perhaps more frequently and we know as catechetical leaders what a rich and beautiful story this is. And so I use it with parents at faith, uh, uh, parent sacramental prep meetings as part of our entry into scripture to understand the, the extraordinary love God has for us and shown to us through the Eucharist. 
So I ask you uh, now. I'm, I'm sorry to um, interrupt. Could you yeah. please uh, go through the slides? Um, it's still on the first slide. Oh, I'm moving here. Gosh. Uh, change presenter. Let me try that. No, not, no, don't change presenter. Just keep the presenter. Just change. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Just keep going through the slides. Great. Thank you. There you go. No problem. All right. So the first question I invite you to reflect upon is, what did you hear? What did you feel in this proclamation? What came most powerfully to you? Was it a word, a phrase, a moment in the story, an insight, an emotion, perhaps a question? And then, how does the story apply to our faith and to our lives? I wish we were together to talk about this at length. And perhaps uh, in the comments that you provide, uh, we're going to be inviting both comments and questions, you could share a little bit on what the Emmaus story uh, spoke to you today. A few things to break open in this beautiful reading. First, Jesus encounters us on the road of our lives as we journey through the twists and turns, the ups and downs. In the gospel story, he encounters two disciples who are in despair. I think it's beautiful that we have this, this understanding that the Lord encounters us, embraces us, and journeys with us at all times and especially in our darkest moments. We come to know Jesus in word that causes our hearts to burn and in the bread, Eucharist, that is broken, blessed, and given. These two disciples, in their despair, encounter Jesus. And in the encounter, the word is poured out, causing their hearts to burn. And then, of course, they come to the table where they encounter Jesus most intimately in Eucharist. Jesus leaves us the gift of himself, abiding with us in the Eucharist. You know, it's why he disappears at the, the, the taking of the Eucharist and the consuming of it. He does not need to hold our hand. He does not need to hang out with us till the end of time. Because we have him, he has given us his abiding presence in Eucharist. And he can be about his father's business elsewhere, knowing that we have him present. The encounter with Jesus is such good news that it can reorient our lives 180 degrees and change everything. What good news the Eucharist is for our lives today particularly for people struggling with anything. These two disciples were leaving Jerusalem, heading back to try to start their lives again. And the encounter with Jesus was so powerful that they went from despair to joy beyond all telling. And they had to return to Jerusalem. They literally turned around 180 degrees, and they did it in the middle of the night. Because experiencing Jesus is such good news that it can't wait until morning. It must be shared. It's a beautiful message for us today as we're being called more and more by the church to be evangelizers, intentional disciples and intentional evangelizers, proclaiming the good news that we know to be true, having encountered and now living with the risen Jesus. So, yes, Eucharist as food for the journey of our lives. And the Emmaus story is something I invite you to go back to frequently and use it with um, groups you're trying to help understand uh, more about the Eucharist.
And I'd like to tell you a brief story about the, the, the journey of my life, uh, in particular in 1999, what I call my drive of a lifetime. It actually started in 1993 when I had a chance to drive out to Southern California for studies one summer. And I went out through El Paso from Chicago and back through the Rockies. I had a wonderful time, but I found myself saying, someday I want to do this without there being a destination. I want the journey to be the destination, not to get to some classes in Long Beach, California. Well, I slept with a road atlas under my bed for a few years and would dream about the, the, the drive I would someday make experiencing the beauty of North America. And then finally, in 1999, I took the rather courageous steps when I look back at it now, of selling my house, quitting my job as a DRE at a Chicago suburban parish, buying a new car, and setting off on what I thought would be a 10 or 12 month journey. Brave, yes, very excited, and a little scared as I was heading out after all those years of anticipation. There's so much that I learned uh, during my 17,000 mile drive from Chicago to Alaska, down to Mexico, and, and back. So many things it would be a talk unto itself. One of the things I can say is that I learned there's so much less to fear out there in the unknown than we think, and that God doesn't want us to live our lives in fear, but in joy and in hope. I was a pilgrim. I was a stranger in a strange land, uh, making up the itinerary to a large degree as I went sometimes with people, sometimes alone. And it was exhilarating. It was exciting and fun. I found myself very shortly into the trip losing track of time. And I wouldn't know whether it was Friday or Tuesday. But something interesting happened. I think I, I blame it on my Catholic DNA or my Catholic biorhythms. I would know when it was coming up on Sunday. So Saturday, or Sunday, I'd be aware that it was time to come home. And what I found was that everywhere I went from, across the western half of uh, North America, I was, as a Catholic, able to find my way home on Sunday to the Eucharist, to Mass. Sometimes it was a national park log cabin or a suburban church or a white clapboard church in the, the, the Yukon uh, or a cathedral. But wherever I was able to find a place to go to Mass, I found myself home. And while the welcoming and hospitality varied, as did the music, uh, sometimes good, sometimes not good, I knew I was with my brothers and sisters in Christ each time I was able to find my way to Mass. And I knew that I was there sharing the stories of salvation that were being read to my family and to my friends back in Chicagoland. And then finally being able to come to the table of the Lord for our Catholic Sunday supper, where I was able to be fed and nourished and grounded for whatever the week held in store for me ahead. Again, a pilgrim on a journey, a stranger in a strange land finding his way, being grounded in Catholic Eucharist, word, sacrament, and community gave me the nourishment to be able to go forward into whatever it is God had for me on the journey of that trip. It was a beautiful insight that I'm so pleased to be able to share with you and others, having had uh, what turned out to be a six-month drive in 1999. Now, God has a sense of humor, and I want to share with you one thing. Along the way, there was one place I was not able to find my way to Mass on a Sunday. Uh, there was no Eucharist in this place. Uh, I want you to imagine God's ironic sense of humor, and uh, can you name where that place is? Well, of course, it was Death Valley. Yes, Death Valley. I spent five days there longer than I expected. It was beautiful, wonderful. But then I realized, oh my gosh, there's nowhere anywhere close where Mass was that Sunday morning. So there I share with you, the one place that has no Eucharist is named Death Valley. So a wonderful trip where, again, I found myself 
relying on Jesus, the Eucharist, uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist as my nourishment for the journey I was undertaking. Now, as a parish DRE back in the 90s, I had, uh, among the many joys, the privilege of gathering first Eucharist children, second graders in school and in RE, on many occasions during their second grade year to help in their formation for the Eucharist. And I would gather the children in church, and in particular, I want to share one um, activity I did with them. It, it, it's one that you can do for your, your children as well. I would gather them and ask, so folks, have you ever been on a long car trip? And of course, the hands would go up, and I'd be told about the trip to Connecticut or to Walt Disney World or to Texas, and even one child to Hawaii. And I think he was just trying to win the longest car ride of everybody in the class. So I would ask them, well, what was that like? How did you like being in the car for such a long drive? Um, and they'd talk about it, and I'd say, so did you drive straight through to Connecticut or to Texas, or did you stop along the way? And we'd talk about the stops that they had. And I would say, well, gosh, there were a lot of reasons to stop, right? Um, bathroom breaks and me meals and um, timeouts because you're misbehaving in the back seat. And, of course, uh, stayovers at hotels and motels because you needed to rest. And I'd ask the kids, so what would have happened if you drove straight through all 18 hours or all 30 hours to get to this place far away. And they talk about how well dad would have got grumpy and I would have gotten hungry and the car would have run out of gas. And I say, ah, guess what? When we go to church on Sunday, it's kind of the same thing. We work hard. There's lots we have to do in our lives, right? There's homework and there's sports and there's chores and everything. What would happen if we just went and went and went and didn't stop? and allow ourselves to be nourished, to be filled up so that we could keep going. And they'd say, well, yeah, like a car gas tank, we'd go to E, we'd go to empty, and we'd run out of energy. And we wouldn't do very well on our tests and all of that. I try to make the connection to help them see how when we go to Mass on Sunday, we're stopping, we're taking time to let God feed us. Let God, in truth, recreate us. The word, I love the word recreation. Mass as recreation. God wanting to renew us, nourish us, recreate us in his word, in his sacrament, and in the community, the body of Christ gathered. And I think the kids got that, that we do need to stop and be still and allow God to love us and fill us as we at the same time give worship to God. So here we are trying to understand the Eucharist, the sacrament of Eucharist. And I really have a sense that most of us out there, parents of our children, don't have a real clear understanding of sacrament. So I'd like to take some time right now to focus in on what sacrament is and also sacramentality. So let's do that. If I were to ask you, what is sacrament? What would you say? Now, you might have a definition in mind, and I can imagine what that definition is. Um, typically, we use a sacred sign instituted by Christ to give grace. And that's a wonderful definition. It still holds as a right and proper and good and helpful definition of sacrament. But I come back and ask you again, if you we're talking to your children or neighbors or friends and trying to explain the Catholic understanding of sacrament, how would you put it to them? How would you unpack that definition? For me, I like to talk about sacrament as a means or a vessel, an instrument, a container, a conduit through which God shares his grace with us an instrument through which God shares his grace with us. Now that begs the question, what is God's grace? 
again, keeping it simple, we don't have to be over-the-top theologians here. Um, God's grace is his love, his essence, his stuff, God's very self. In talks, I'll often take the water bottle I might have handy and say, so let's think of the water bottle here as sacrament. It, it's the container, it's the instrument, it's the vessel. And the water that's inside, let's think of it as the grace. And an activated sacrament is one that pours out the, the, the grace contained therein, out into the world, into us. There is sacrament because God desperately wants to be in relationship with us. God is in love with us and seeks to be in, communi in communion with us. And sacrament is a means by which God is able to pour himself out for the world, for us. Now, I'm going to give you a little advanced angle on sacrament now, something I struggled a fair amount with when I was in the seminary. I ended up um, getting my degree, but not getting ordained. And three years ago, I got married to a, a wonderful woman, Christy, who's a catechetical leader in her own right. But I was so blessed to have those years uh, in the seminary, being able to slowly come to grasp the profound and magnificent theology of our faith. And so one thing that I want to offer here that goes a little deeper on sacrament is that sacrament is something that points to a reality beyond itself, but also at the same time participates in that reality and helps to make that reality present and actualized. Now that's tricky. It was for me when I was studying full time. Let me use the Eucharist as an example. The Eucharist points us to the messianic banquet of heaven that hopefully we'll all participate in. And it points to a world that has truly become the kingdom of God, where peace and love and justice reign. But it doesn't just point to heaven. It doesn't just point to a world where God reigns. It helps to make it real and present now in our midst. The multivalent or the multi-layers of sacrament. So again, sacrament points to reality out there that also helps to make that reality real here and now. So we've talked about sacrament. Let me shift over to that second word on our screen, sacramentality. I love this concept. And sacrament falls within this broader context of sacramentality. Here I have a stanza from a Elizabeth Baird Browning poem that we can read together. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only those who see take off their shoes. The rest sit round it and pluck blackberries. Interesting. What do you think Baird Browning is trying to say here? I offer that there are two premises for sacramentality. One, creation is good and holy. Now, this might seem self-evident, but it's very important that we name this. We have histories in Christianity and, uh, and, and the whole world of, of dualism, where we tend to think of the stuff of the world as evil, as bad. And we have to be reminded that, no, God created the world good and has made it holy. And second, God uses the stuff of his creation to bless, reach us and to bless us. Ah, we're, we're into the sacramental realm here, aren't we? So let's go back to the poem. Let's read it again. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only those who see take off their shoes. The rest sit round it and pluck blackberries. Again, I wish we were all in the same room and I could hear from you on what 
your understanding is uh, of what uh, Elizabeth Baird Browning is saying in this stanza about our world. Now, Elizabeth Baird Browning was not Catholic, but she's preventing a, presenting a thoroughly Catholic worldview here that we are standing on holy ground. Wherever you're sitting right now, you're sitting on, you're standing on holy ground. It's all holy ground. Even the tragedies, the sufferings, the alienations, we're on holy ground. There may be evil, there may be sin, there may be the, the frailties of human existence, but it is holy ground we stand. Grace is abundant. This is, I believe, what she's saying. And not only is it abundant, it is accessible. Grace is available. And this is such a Catholic concept. For us, we believe that God in Jesus' death and resurrection has definitively won the world. Won the world for God. Won the world for grace. We have a God more powerful than sin, greater than death. We have a God that loves us intimately. And since Christ's resurrection, definitive victory, every day we live is really the Easter season. When we watch the news and are continually told about all the evil and tragedy occurring, we can start to have a jaded understanding of the world. We can conclude that the world is going to the proverbial hell in a handbasket. My dad had a little bit of that view later in his life. Uh, he watched a little too much CNN, I think. Oh, David, I'm going to break in here. I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. I'll continue. The Catholic response to uh, cynicism fearfulness and a depressive worldview is no. No. The world cannot be lost to grace. Christ has the definitive victory. And God gives us this assurance in Jesus' death and resurrection. So we are called to see the world through a sacramental lens, such as what Elizabeth Barrett Browning offers to us here. The world is an endless means of experiencing God and God's grace. The world is created good, is restored in Jesus Christ, and is essentially sacramental. The world is sacramental. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us have the eyes of our soul to see that we are standing on holy ground and that we each day should take off our shoes in reverent worship. Now, this is very Catholic stuff, and I just want to point out three things here. St. Francis' love for nature was him communicating a recognition of grace abundant in our world. St. Ignatius, talking about finding God in all things, was this Catholic worldview that the world has been redeemed and we can find God in all things. And finally, Pope Francis's new encyclical on care for our common home is a reaffirmation of the profoundly Catholic understanding that this world is good, created, beautiful, and holy, and as such deserves our care. So, reflecting on sacrament and sacramentality, I want to invite you to try to name the sources of grace in your life. And as you do that, don't just think about the seven public means of grace, the seven sacraments that we all celebrate, but also think beyond to the full range of possibilities for how God is communicating his grace to you in your life. For me, things like nature and prayer and music and especially people, the people in my life are profound sources of grace and are, in essence, sacraments. And so, who has been sacrament in your life? And have you had the chance to thank them? 
to communicate that to them, that they have been the face of God, the presence of Jesus for, for you. To whom have you been sacrament? Recognize that you are a means of God transmitting grace into the lives of others. What a beautiful concept, recognizing that we are sacramental conduits of God's love and forgiveness and truth to the world. We need to recognize that we're not just called to receive sacraments, but we're called to live them, to be a conduit of grace. And so, what is the sacrament? What is the sacrament upon which all other grace flows? Well, I hope you came up with the answer I did. Our Catholic faith teaches us it's Jesus. Jesus is the sacrament, the instrument, the conduit, the um, means by which God communicates himself to us. Isn't that how we understand sacrament? And all grace and all sacraments flow from the person of Jesus. Now, what I'd like to do as we round the bend to our concluding is to invite us to think about, as Catholic families, how do we connect sacraments, the understanding of sacraments, to our, our home and our home life. Uh, today there is a disconnect out there that people perceive religion as something that has nothing really to do with their reality, their, their lives. It's something you, you step into for an hour, perhaps on Sunday, and then you go back to real life. And we have to dispel this disconnect understanding. And, and we can connect our faith in our home throughout our, our forming of families in Catholic faith. So families preparing for their child to receive First Reconciliation and First Eucharist, I invite you to think about what is the connecting theme in the Sacrament of Reconciliation between Catholic faith and your home? What is the theme in Sacrament of Reconciliation that we can be practicing as a family, should be practicing every day, should be giving attention to? Well, it's forgiveness. The question I ask of families is, how well do you forgive as a family in your home, in your relationships? How well do you model forgiveness to one another? For that opens up the possibility of your child being able to grasp and, and accept the unconditional, limitless mercy of God. We first have to experience mercy in our human relationships to be able to grasp the mercy of God. And then for the sacrament of the Eucharist, what would be a connecting theme between home life and our faith? Well, I submit it's meal. How well do we as a family do meal together? Do we take times at least a couple, three times a week to have really quality meal experiences where we tell the stories of our day, of our life? We connect and we know how each other is doing and we do that over the intimate, profound act of, of sharing food, of breaking bread. If we can do meal well in the home, that gives us a better chance to understand what's happening at Sunday Mass when we as a big Catholic family come together around our table for that meal that God so desires that we feed on. You see, sacraments are grounded in and they are supposed to be impactful of real life and not disconnected. We have to fight this disconnect mindset that is out there today. So looking ahead to our next uh, session, which is available, and I'll give you the link in a moment, in the second retreat session, we will be doing some theology 
on the Eucharist. We'll be exploring why Mass and the Eucharist is so central to Catholic faith and life. We cannot over-catechize on Eucharist, both liturgy and the sacrament itself. It is so part and parcel essential to having people be, become Catholic and stay Catholic, and it really is the epicenter of our faith because it is Jesus. We're going to, in the next session, consider the hungers of the human heart, that hunger motif, and how God desires to satisfy the hungers of our human heart. Preparing for part two, I invite you to reflect on the following. How are baptism and Eucharist related? Those two sacraments are in, in deep and intimate relationship to the three sacraments of initiation, of course. Why do you go to Mass? And of course, speaking to a room full of parents, or not, I always want to be real with them, and I don't want them to feel like they have to hide or lie. Let's talk about why you go to Mass, and perhaps why not. And then we can, we can break into that a little bit and perhaps help them get to a, a better place. Why is it important for us to be looking at your faith life and relationship to God at this time of preparation for your child's first Eucharist? Why do we emphasize parent faith life at the time of a child's coming to sacraments? Well, of course, it's because you can't give what you don't have. And it's really kind of a sham if we focus on the children that this is a wonderful thing for them, but the parents don't have a vibrant, active, living faith in Jesus and God, um, it, it doesn't make sense that we're trying to sacramentalize our children then. So looking at the parents and their own faith life is essential. And I ask the parents, what do you hunger for? And I ask you catechetical leaders, what do you hunger for? And what do you turn to to satisfy the hungers of your heart? And finally, what most interests you or speaks to you in the provided handouts? And there are handouts that are uh, available uh, related to this two-part series. Part one takeaways. What insights will you want to consider beyond today? What Will you be thinking about driving home today? What did you make notes on and want to uh, take some quiet time to reflect or study further? Does anything from today challenge you in some way? I wish we had time to talk about that. And please feel free to share in the comments. What gives you a sense of joy or hope? What will you want to apply to your personal life and your family life? These are all questions I ask you and I ask parents who, whom we're forming. Now, there are a few other webinars that I've done that I wanted to make you aware of. Uh, part two is uh, linked right here. It's a long link. Uh, it's on the uh, sadly your YouTube channel. And I believe in the follow-up uh, email that you're to, to receive you'll be getting uh, this as a link that you can click on. If not, go get this slide uh, from the YouTube channel because uh, this is going to go up on YouTube and you could, heck, you could probably find both of them easier just clicking on Eucharist Sadlier on the YouTube channel. Uh, there's also uh, a Sadlier webinar I did a couple years ago on partnering with parents, the best investment a parish can make. And that seems to be uh, a helpful uh, hour with catechetical leaders exploring ways we can concretely connect with parents better and making them our partners. And then finally, I did a um, series of webinars, short webinars, 20 minutes each, last summer with the U.S. Conference for Catholic Bishops. And there's that link. Hopefully you're going to get all links in, in an easy click on and get their manner. Uh, but they are here for you um, listed on this slide. So resources. Um, I have a parent handout that I use when I do parent faith formation or first Eucharist talks that I want to share with you. I've uh, uploaded two videos, one of me doing a Eucharist 
and a reconciliation parent prep session. So you could watch those, you could beg, borrow, and steal from any of them, and you could even use clips of, of them if you would ever want. Um, I hope if this webinar has been helpful to you, you would make use of uh, any of the concepts, any of the resources provided. It's all free to you. It would please me if I knew they were being used. And share this, uh, any of this with other catechetical leaders uh, who might benefit from any of it, either listening to the webinars or using the resources. I love sharing, and I love knowing that we're, uh, we're borrowing uh, from each other to provide greater experiences for our, our parents and families. Um, and so then I have down here, uh, if you get to that page, click on what says New Webinar Resources, and you'll be able to access uh, what I've just spoken of. So we've concluded the webinar itself, and now I'm really looking forward to about 11 minutes or so of Q&A time. And I want to meet your needs. And I hope that uh, you've shared some insights from today. Um, and David, I think, will uh, read some of that. Uh, and then also the questions that you have that I might have uh, a little bit of wisdom in responding to. It's such a privilege being with all of you. Uh, I really enjoy the opportunity for my desk here in, in, in Crest Hill, Illinois, in the Diocese of Joliet, being able to interface with you. The only thing lacking is I wish we could see each other, and I wish we could um, you know, go back and forth together on this wonderful, amazing mystery of love that is the Eucharist and how we help form our parents and our children more deeply in the Eucharist and how we ourselves enter ever more deeply into this mystery of Jesus poured out for us in the Eucharist. So David, what are comments, questions that we have? Uh, yes, Tom, it was, that was a great webinar. I'm pretty sure everyone was uh, blessed by everything. Uh, we have here a question from Anna Aguila. And her question is, can slides be found on a website or be provided via PDF? So the slides from this webinar, I tell you what, if there's interest in that, if it would be helpful, David, why don't you and I commit to finding a way to make that happen for our participants and you'll communicate that to uh, the folks by email. Yes, that wouldn't be a problem at all. I mean, we already have the slides, so that wouldn't, I mean, as long as you're not a, uh, against us sharing your slides, and we no. would not. <laughs> we'll, we'll get them out to everybody, so no worries. Beautiful. Then, Ana Aguila, um, if you just email me at uh, deepisono at Sadlier, um, I will be happy to get those slides to you. And I think, David, probably there, there are others, too. So we'll find a way, I think, if I'm not speaking out of turn, where those who are participating can, can access this by one means or another. So stay tuned. Yes. We also have Renee, who also says that she would also have love to have the slides for a presentation as well. And she provided her email kind of saying, hey, here's my email. Send them. So yeah. we so will. We'll, we'll get it out to everybody. Don't you worry. Yes, yes. Uh, let me see, we have here, um, says, George says, please send those slides to all of the participants on this webinar. There you go. You got Why it, George. Why not, George? <laughs> so any, any comments or questions? Let that, me see, uh, they're, they're coming in now. Um, uh, where's the link for the part two of this webinar? That we'll include that as well. If, if you get the slides from our presentation, obviously a couple slides back, you'll see all those links. And you may have to actually type them in, but you'll, you'll find a way to get to part two and also to the USCCB stuff, which I think those three little mini webinars uh, are on very helpful, important topics for catechetical leaders. So I hope you'll, you'll uh, benefit from those as well. Yes, I think the majority of the people just want your slides. <laughs> <Is> that, <laughs> That's wonderful. And is that also, folks, also, yeah. The, I was just going to say there is a handout with that is kind of important, and I hand it out to parents. And we sometimes have time to talk about quotes. I've collected Eucharistic quotes over the years that I've put into a two-sided handout, and we want to get that to everybody as well. And you can modify that as you want. Just if there are quotes you like, quotes you don't like, do, do whatever you want with it. But again, sharing the, the wisdom, right? That's what 
uh, the community out there of catechetical leaders is all about. Let's share our wisdom. I have a question here from Lianamar Medina. And her question is, what is your recommendation about what could be the first theme to open a first session of parent formation, First Communion Parents? First Communion Parents. Well, you know, I think we need to speak to their lives. Folks today don't have the time, the energy, or the inclination for a lot of theology that's up there in the clouds, over their heads, disconnected. It's like, what does this have to do with my life? So don't do that. We can bring theology, weave it into themes that connect to real life, okay? So like with the Emmaus story, you know, I like reading that gospel and then talking about, you know, these two disciples were in dark despair. Everything that they had put their hopes into was dashed. You know, they were going to follow Jesus, their Savior, and, and now he's dead. You know, have you ever been in a place of despair, of darkness, where there was no light and no hope and no joy. Well, that's where these two people are as Jesus comes and walks with them and, and brings light and joy back to them. Well, that's our God. Our God wants to accompany us in our darkness, in our struggles, in our trials, in the, in the difficulties of life, as well as the joys, and wants to be our light, our hope, and it is Jesus who brings that light to us. You know, so speaking to people's lives, I, uh, people love to talk about themselves. So maybe you get them talking a little bit about whatever and start to weave in how Jesus and Catholic faith is good news to their lives as parents who maybe aren't getting enough sleep or working two jobs and everything else. You're a cooperator in creation with, with God. Um, help them to see that the good news of Jesus Christ has something to say to their lived experience now, who they are, where they're at, and that they're standing on holy ground. God loves them. They may not be perfect parents, certainly not perfect people, but they are beloved in God's eyes. I think people need to hear a message of hope and not be, be beaten over the head. They've got enough guilt and everything else. We want to love them, embrace them, and bring them to a better place, a fuller, richer place of living Catholic faith. I think that's the Pope Francis mode, is not beat them over the head um, and tell them how terrible and how they're lacking, but give them a sense of joy and hope, and that will be attractive. Amen. Uh, thank you um, for the question, and thank you, uh, Tom, for that response. Also, we have Kim here who wants to comment, says, also, I love the focus about the connection between the parent faith journey and the children's faith journey and recognizing that the two must go hand in hand. Mm. Thank you for that insight. Um, also, the analogy of the car ride, says Barbara. Thank you very much for the car ride. Um, let me see, is there a way to, yes, just for, just for everyone to know, we will be uploading this webinar onto the Sadlier um, webinar um, uh, section on the site. So uh, we would have, we'll have this up very soon so that if you were not able to listen um, completely, you could do it. Or if you heard, you can go back again. I find that sometimes going back and listening helps to, um, you know, maybe even um, deepen a bit more in certain uh, things that were spoken. I know that sometimes I'll hear something and I'll go back and I'll say, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, the person said that. So, yes, they, they will be available again. Um, you know what we covered, David, really probably should have been two or three hours in length. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for folks to, to have some stillness and quiet. One right. of the things I think we do in our prayer today is we have a multiplication of words and we're very busy and is we're trying to squeeze things into our prayer. We need to learn how to be still and to be quiet and, and give space for us to enter into the mystery of God's love for us. Right. So, um, you know, I went fast because we only have an hour today. Right. If I was with you doing a retreat experience in your diocese um, or whatever, this would have been a much slower, less um, 
high paced experience. Right, right. It, it was a good pace. <laughs> high but good. <laughs> um, we have Diane here that says, um, can you do a seminar on the sacrament of confirmation as well? Oh, well, I, I, I could. Um, we'll bring that to Sadlier. Um, let's, let's see. I think the next one I would w want to do is maybe sometime on reconciliation, kind of looking at parent formation for reconciliation and for, for confirmation. I think both of those really need to be given attention um, in relationship to, to Eucharist. I always want all the sacraments to be related uh, so folks understand how Eucharist is at the center of it all. Um, baptism relates to it because baptism is the setting out on the journey, the orientation to Christ, and Eucharist is food for the journey. Of course, the relationship between the Eucharist and reconciliation and, and forgiveness so we can come worthily to the sacrament. Right. Um, so always ground all sacrament formation in Eucharist, um, and let's see what other sacraments maybe we want to tackle down the road. Amen. We have an interesting question here from Jenny uh, Bayer. She says, she asks, um, do you have advice for working with a student of a parent that is not able to receive the sacrament of Eucharist because of a remarriage, et cetera? Thank you. Well, for you know, we have so many non-Catholic parents today, right? Uh, mixed marriages, and um, so our formation needs to be attentive to that, and we need to speak with sensitivity to the complex dynamics of a non-Catholic parent, maybe even a non-Christian parent, and then also divorce um, and perhaps remarriage, which would at that point then be an issue in terms of receiving uh, the sacraments. So just be sensitive and, and to speak about how, you know, not Christian non-Catholics are our brothers and sisters in Christ and we have so much more in common than, than, than not, and speak about the commonalities, the things we have in common, and then also speak clearly, uh, teach clearly about the things we believe as Catholics that perhaps um, evangelicals or even in some cases Protestants would not believe as we do as Catholics. So help families to understand the distinctions. But in terms of the pastoral issue of a, of a parent not being able to receive First Eucharist, I just love them. Be sensitive to that and perhaps help guide them to the possibility of them, them uh, normalizing their relationship with the church and being able to come back into sacramental communion. You know, our Pope is talking about making that process easier of annulment. So this year of mercy is going to be a wonderful year where hopefully people will profoundly see the mercy of God embodied, not just in our Pope, but in each of us. Um, we have Debbie here, our sister Debbie, that says, Tom, I like how you once explained how for adults this needs to be important to them, as does yoga, the gym, food, etc. That's a challenge for us all. Mm. Yes, it is. Um, I saw 20 years ago, and it's only increased. We have to form families and parents with the idea of fostering conversion in parents first. That's my goal if I'm a parish DRE today, conversion in the hearts and lives of parents. And then everything else is easy. Everything else will fall into place, folks. If we don't work towards that, um, we're spinning our wheels largely, aren't we? We're trying to pour information and faith into children who go home to homes that aren't evangelized. And as a result, a lot of our work goes for naught. So please shift the focus to how do we bring home an evangelizing message of conversion to Jesus Christ for our parents, our grandparents. Um, and, and that's the primary effort I think we have before us today. Beautiful. Um, I think we're we, probably about out of time. Yes. Let me just um, Can I squeeze, first squeeze of all answer this one question. Yeah, this is from Anita uh, Melgosa that says, do you know of any who offers webinars for parents in Spanish? And I want to tell uh, Anita that uh, we do. We will be working on them very, very, very soon. So no te preocupes que muy pronto estaremos dando eh, seminarios en español. Así que, just so you um, are aware of that, Anita, um, very soon we'll be working on that. And just for everybody to know that 
We have two other webinars that are, um, we have one on October 6th with Kathy Hendricks, uh, Making the Family Connection in Catechesis, and another in November, Connecting the Holy Year of Mercy, Using We Believe and We, be we Live Our Faith. So, um, uh, just so you know, uh, Tom, there are other, uh, I'm pretty sure you can read them, people are we're very happy and excited and uh, pleased with your presentation. So um, well, praise the Lord the for that. Privilege, tr yeah. true privilege to be with you folks. Perhaps you've been with me in the past. I hope to meet you someday, but until that time, let's keep each other in prayer and let's ask the Holy Spirit to come and bless our ministry. Amen. Well, thank you each and every one for uh, being here. We will um, get the uh, these hands out um, hands out to you, so you can have them readily accessible to use in your retreats um, and to share this information. And also, we will very also um, also have the certificates for those that were uh, here the whole time. And also, we will um, have the webinar as well accessible in our webinar section on the Sad Gear web page. So thank you so much for being here. God bless you. Uh, let's continue to pray for one another and I really hope that today you uh, understood that the Eucharist uh, is the only one that can satisfy our deepest hunger. So goodbye and God bless.